Cook here at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Thank you for joining us. Before I introduce today's speaker, um, just a little bit of information about things that are coming up here at the KIA. Uh, tomorrow, you are welcome to join us at 2 p.m. in the library for the book discussion of Burning Roses. You do not need to have read the book in order to join the discussion. You are welcome. Um, also, it is time for our annual holiday art sale with the Kirk Newman Art School. If you're a KIA member, you can come on Thursday night, that is members night, and Friday and Saturday um, is open to all. Um, and there's always really exciting things at the art sale and the proceeds go to the artists as well as the school to support scholarships and things like that. So we hope that you come and do some holiday shopping or shopping just for yourselves. Um, and so without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Lei Hua Wang, who is the Chinese Endowed Assistant Professor of Chinese Language and Literature at Kalamazoo College. With a background in comparative literature, she is interested in various topics on traditions, including their formation, transmission, and transformation. She taught at Sarah Lawrence College in New York and Pacific Lutheran University in Washington before she came to join us here in Kalamazoo in 2019. And this art break is um, connected with the exhibition downstairs, which is called Captive Beauties. Um, and if you have not yet had a chance to go and see that exhibition, the KIA will be open for the hour after art break. So please go. I know that Dr. Wang is gonna give us some more context about the lives of the women that were depicted in those works of art. So please welcome Dr. Wang. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to give my talk here today. I'm a scholar of cultural studies. Some of my research is on the Chinese intellectual tradition and its interactions with popular culture. My talk is a continuation of Dr. Liu Yang's talk last Tuesday, which was uh, online. In his talk, Dr. Liu discussed the images of flowers in the depiction of women in this exhibition downstairs. I would like to take a slightly different perspective. My talk looks at the depiction of female beauty as erotic object in the male voyeuristic gaze. My talk also discusses discusses its variations and deviations in different contexts. Before we move to these paintings, I would like to make three points. First, we shall keep in mind that sexual symbols may be more implicit in some paintings than in others. To present sexual symbols in an encrypted, covert, an acceptable, acceptable manner was often demanded by the new Confucian values of the late imperial China. And it was also required by the scholar official intellectual tradition that to a certain degree dismissed indulgence in physical pleasure. Secondly, there are variations of and deviations from erotic objectification. In the second part of my talk, when we look at these varied and deviated features of erotic depictions, we will pay attention to the artist's deliberate purpose or the supporting narrative or some particularized context of these paintings. Thirdly, the depiction of women we look at today belong to the genre of Meiren paintings or beautiful women paintings. These Meiren paintings differ from the other, sorry for that, from the, this Meiren, uh, this Meiren paintings differ from the other genre of Chun Gong Tu or erotic paintings that feature nudity and much more provocative sexual imagery and symbolism. We today discuss a genre of Meiren paintings. 
脑子春宫图配天线。I'm going to start with this painting of 1847 as my introduction of the traditional erotic depiction of young beauty. The two young females follow the literary convention of describing female beauty. They both have cloud-like hair. The eyebrows are like moth antennae. Or distant mountains, they have cherry-like mouth. Their skin is as fair as snow or, jade, or white jade, and forth, and so on. The rendering of their background is quite unique. Traditional paintings always place females in boudoir or in garden. This painting does not reveal any detail of the background, and the painting takes a round shape, as if we, as viewers, look through a moon-shaped window or a round mirror. Without any distraction from the background and with the round-shaped focal viewpoint, the attention of us is drawn to the young and unblemished faces of these two women. As we're at their beautiful clothing and elaborate hair ornaments, all of which are meticulously rendered. In addition to their physical appearance, we can also see a book that one girl is showing to the other, and a fan one of them is holding. The book and the fan are positioned in such a way as if we were invited to associate these two items with these two beautiful faces. While the lines in the book are obscure to us, we can see clearly the fan and the blooming flowers painted in it. What are these two girls reading? What are the connections between the lines you're looking at and the fan with blossoms? Are these two young women reading together a love poem? While some of the features, such as the omission of the background, are unique, this painting follows the generics of depicting women as erotic object. But with rather figurative symbols and similes, it invites it invites a male scholar's voyeuristic gaze in a implicit and a covert way. In this painting, we see another kind of depiction of females, who are rendered with more explicit erotic appeal. In the center, a group of courtesans playing musical instruments for scholar officials in a drinking garden party. The facial expressions and gestures of these courtesans give clear "come hither" invitation. They successfully get the attention of the male patron and his guests. One guest in drinking is about to stand up to greet them. In the left side of the painting, we see another group in a pavilion. A scholar official is playing zither for his male friends. A female, likely his concubine, is listening attentively behind him. We do not see any of her hair. Ornaments, her quiet presence in a more intellectual setting accentuates the sexual attributes that we see in the group of courtesans in the center of the same painting. While last painting portrays female beauty in the presence of a group of male scholar official warriors, but. However, the male voyeur could be absent. It is a a common thing to depict 
beautiful women waiting for their absent lovers. This painting of late seventh century presents a group of court ladies playing cards in a garden. It is springtime with bloom tree and magnolia blossoms. Tree flowers are blooming. The bold look of these ladies show that they are not interested in the game itself. They are playing cards merely to kill time while awaiting an imperial summons. Females are often depicted in a romantic encounter. In the center of the painting. Is an elegantly dressed young traveler on horseback. He looks back to cast a glance at the girl who reclines against the window of a thatched hut, and tilts her bed slightly to the other side. She is not directly engaged to the gaze of the traveler, but her look and the way she turns her face. Indicates that she is aware of and responsive to the young man's gaze. Again, it is springtime. Willows are misty, and peach trees are blooming. The young female, suggested by her hairstyle, is not yet married. She may be expecting a young lover. In Chinese fiction, from the Tang period onward. Women who allow themselves to be seen by passing men, in effect, open the way, however unintentionally, to sexual access. Stories that begin with a chance viewing often end with her seduction. However, in this painting, the traveler, the traveler on horseback, is shown to be in a hurry. The roadside hut. Is rendered in a way that the young woman looks to be upstairs, with no door or any other easy access visibly shown in the painting. This painting is identified to echo to a turning point that tells the story of a chance viewing, not leading to a romantic relationship. The turning point goes. This very day last year, by this door, peach blossoms were in bloom against her blue, uh, against her blushing cheeks. But where, pray, is she now? Why the peach blossoms are still there, smiling in the spring breezes? In the point, the young woman is no longer there. When the male traveler finally comes back to visit visit her one year later. In the last four slides, we look at the male voyeuristic depictions of female beauty. We see encrypted or implicit or explicit sexual symbols and similes, such as flowers in garden, flowery. Hair ornaments, and in and ornaments in dressing, and in accoutrements. In the following two slides, we will look at some variations of these generic erotic depictions. Females are not always depicted with. Explicit sexual symbols readily presented in the paintings. Those variations are often required by the narratives. According to numerous poems and paintings by male scholars, Su Xiao Su Xiao Xiao was an, a famous singer and a courtesan who lived around 400 to 500 CE. In this painting, Su Xiaoxiao is portrayed as an aging beauty. The poem contained in the artist's own inscription reads, "She is not grieving for autumn now, nor moved by spring. The silken fan back in its box, 
a new ones in his hand. As fragrant breezes bring contentment, the metal wind now fades. In this world, can anyone plumb the truth of her heart? The painter and the poet lament that while spring is coming, Su Xiaoxiao no longer cares. She is deeply saddened by the fact that she is no longer attractive, and no longer favored favored by her lover, who turns attention away from her to younger and newer women. We see in the background rocks and frozen bamboos. Instead of the flower imageries prevalent in previous paintings, much like the painting of the aged singer Su Xiaoxiao, this painting of 1650 by Wang Jian Zhang was an inspiration of a literary work on aging beauty. The artist's own inscription in the painting. Tells us that he created this work for his friend, who acquired a calligraphic rendering of the Pi Pa Xing, which is also translated as "Song of the Pi Pa Player." "Song of Pi Pa Player" is a famous narrative poem by the Tang poet Bai Juyi. This Tang poem tells the story of a once courtesan and now an Old female pipa player, who is deserted by her merchant husband. The woman in the painting faces away from us, and we can only see her remote back at a distance. She is presented deliberately as an obscure figure. This, this as the poem relates. She is no longer attractive in physical appearance. It is her sorrow, resulted from the lost affection, that touches the poet, the artist, and us as viewers. In the following slides, we will look at several other paintings as the as variations of. And the deviations from the generic erotic paintings of female beauty. In those slides, we will pay attention to female voices, female domestic roles in marriage, and the settings of popular culture. This painting presents to us an aristocratic lady at her toilet. She is arranging her hair with the assistance of a maiden. In their back, another maiden is arranging the bed. The accoutrements of the room include luxurious silk garments, decorative mirror, and a flower vase. There are scrolls in the vase, and on the top of the bed, the yellow box. All these details show to us this lady is a woman of beauty and also of culture. An interesting de detail makes it different from the previous paintings. What is centered in our view is not the lady herself, but rather the canopy bed and the quilt that the maiden is attending to. While a lady at toilet. With its intimate setting, is a conventional thing in erotic painting paintings of women. The association here is slightly shifted to conjugal celebration, with the canopy bed in the center of the view. The upper left side contains a poem by female collector, who we know today to be a poet. And the wife of a scholar official. With the centered canopy bed and with the poetic calligraphic inscription by a self-identified female collector, 
this painting presents to us some deviation from the generic male voyeuristic gaze of beautiful women. Once placed in the setting of marriage, females often have lesser erotic bearings in depiction. In this painting, we see a couple engaging in intimate conversation. Rather than appearing to serve her husband, this woman seems to command almost an equal amount of space and attention. We say in the room accoutrements, some plum together with bamboo branches in the vase. It is winter time, but the warmth of the stove in front of the couple and the books behind them suggest affection and the intellectual bindings between the husband and the wife. This painting presents to us the domestic power structure in a scholar official family. The scholar official is portrayed as the center of the painting. Sitting in the main hall, he looks relaxed in casual clothing and in slippers. He is giving orders to a male servant. In the upper chamber in the right, there are a group of women and children. Children are either sitting or kneeling before the woman in blue clothing. To her left side, there is another woman of seemingly less status, who is shaded by curtains. And in the adjacent room, maids are busy with cooking. Unlike the other paintings, this woman in blue faces us in a direct way. She engages us in a gaze in the same way that her husband in the main hall does. Much like her husband, this woman demands attention and respect. She has her right to do so. With the activities in order in the chamber, she she is in her active role within the family. She manages the household together with her husband, though with different domestic duties and responsibilities. We do not see much ornament in this woman's hair or clothing. She is presented much less as an erotic object, but rather as a figure of domestic responsibility and power. What we now look at in the left is an album leaf of late Qing. In this painting, a man and woman stand beside a cauldron from which flames shoot out. Two naked children look out from the cauldron, seemingly unperturbed by the flames. The woman is gently drawing one of the children out of the cauldron. Judging by the eight trigrams on the cauldron lid on the ground, the Taoist accoutrements on the nearby table, and the way the adults are dressed in leaves and animal skins, we may infer that this painting presents a scene of the creation of humankind by two mythological figures, Nu Wa and Fu Xi. For comparison, I place here to the right a tongue painting of these two mythological figures. As we can see in the album leaf in the left, the, these two mythological fingers, figures are rather demystified. They are presented as an ordinary young couple. The woman seems to take more action in the process of children making. Again, in this family structure, female is presented more as an agent in action and in duty, 
rather than as a passive erotic object. The mythological scenes of the creation of humankind are more favored by popular culture, and not so commonly found in male elite poetry or painting. The depictions of women in popular culture in late imperial China often differ from those in elite culture. This painting was once part of the paintings used in Buddhist mortuary rites, honoring the souls of the dead. To the right side, a woman and her child are both in white mourning clothing. She is presenting a legal case to an official. We do not see much ornament in her hair or in her clothing. There is very little sexual attribute in her bearings. Her gendered role in this painting is more defined in the popular understanding of the political power structure, rather than being viewed in the male elitist voyeuristic gaze. The erotic depiction of women are often part of the male scholar official culture. Sometimes the artists render and accentuate the deliberate absence of sexual symbols, as required by narratives. These women depicted as erotic objects are often imaginary literary figures that are constructed. Through numerous paintings and poetry by generations of literati, as often evinced by layers of inscriptions and colophons containing literary allusions made by the artists themselves and by the collectors. Instances of such could be found in the painting of the. The singer or the play of pipa, uh, the uh, the painting of pipa xing, and the painting of the singer Su Xiaoxiao, and also in the nymph of the lower river, which is not yet mentioned in this talk, but part of this exhibition downstairs. The erotically depicted beauty often has. More has rather unstable or weak connections with marriage. They could be unmarried young women in passing romantic encountering, or courtesans entertaining scholar officials, or deserted aging wives. Once situated in marriage. The women in these paintings are often portrayed according to their roles in domestic life, and they are rendered with much fewer erotic attributes in appearance and in bearing. Those paintings could be found more often in popular culture, such as a Buddhist ceremonial site, and less common in male elites. Male elite paintings. I would like to end my talk on the paintings of the late imperial China, with two bulletin points on the social and political changes in China of the 20th century, after the Qing Dynasty ended in 1912. The male, the the feminist movements in the 20th century. Were initiated and led by male elites, those once scholar officials and modern intellectuals. And in these feminist movements, women were encouraged to lead their household, to receive education, and to join the workforce in modern society. Thank you. I. Would like to express my gratitude to Jessica, Sandra, and Mary, Miriam, Thomas,、um, and to Shanna who assisted me with the preparation.
And to Dr. Liu Yang, who helped me immensely with the images and articles. And I wanted to express my appreciation to my dear colleagues at the Kalamazoo College who show generous support and who come to my talk here today. And I want to thank my students of Chinese 300 who came to the exhibition with me last Friday and provided me with insights and new perspectives. Thank you to you all. So I think I may have some time for questions, comments. Yes. So what's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not very informed about Chinese art, but I once read something that talked about hair styles, mm -hmm. and that you could tell what era like a lot of the paintings stay the same through the centuries, like hair. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, could tell you what century you're in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Seems like also hair is important. I, I, yes. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your question. Your question is about the hairstyle and the hair status. And does, uh, and whether those style change over time. Yes, the hairstyle change over time, but there were some consistent features. And usually people can tell whether a woman is married or not married uh, with a particular hairstyle. And this is from, uh, so you, Oftentimes, younger, not yet married, they have this hair uh, put up on both sides. And because of this very feature, we could infer the young girl in the thatched hut. But in the thatched hut is not yet married. And also the uh, ladies of upper class, Often time have more hair ornaments than um, than women of commoners. Okay. <laughs> yes. Oh, when I look at um, when I hear you talking about the male voyeuristic mm -hmm. erotic aspects of these paintings. It just strikes me how different it is from the way that that appears in like European painting, which I have seen a lot more of. Mm -hmm. If I just looked at these paintings myself, I would not come to that. I would not see that at all. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you have any comments about maybe the, the differences in terms of how mm -hmm. it just evolved? Because in a way, the theme is the same. Mm -hmm. A lot of you know women being painted were for male players yeah. of pleasures, but yet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you very much. This is a really good point. Your uh, your question is about um, is about uh, is of the evidence of the male voyeuristic gaze in these paintings. Um, a one. My talk is inspired by Dr. Liu Yang's talk. His talk last week was a lot on the flowery imagery. And also my talk got quite a lot of inspiration by a scholar uh, on Chinese art. His name is uh, James K. Hill. And uh, so it make me to connect the flower, the flower, the image of flower with female genitalia. And there are a lot literary allusions, a lot of literary allusions uh, in Chinese culture that connects femininity, especially the, the physical appearing, uh, the physical appeal of femininity with flowers. 
And also, yes, this is just the perspective I take to look at the paintings uh, in this collection, in this talk. There should be many other perspectives, such as the, the, the gender power, for example. And uh, yes. Were the women of the courses made up with very thin eyebrows and to look a certain way? Yes. And you said the books were like cherry. Yes. Um, was that typical of the paintings or is that how they looked? Uh, yes. Uh, this is how they, so it, uh, this, is this painting? we can see the literary conventions of female beauties and how a female, uh, a beautiful woman should look like. These standards are quite consistent. Uh, yet was those beauty standards were established uh, really early in history and it passed down. It passed down through poetry, through other literary works, and through paintings. Thank you. Yes? So after 1911, that's the last. Mm -hmm. so, so then, uh, this, everything changed very dramatically. You know, you yes. The whole image of women. Yes. Came Mm -hmm. did not see women so much as objects of beauty. Yes. Especially as you said, 1920. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yes, you are very right. After 1911, uh, the standards of women beauty have changed drastically. And especially 19, after 1949. So women... Uh, are considered to be able to hold up half of the of the sky, so gender neutrality replaces femininity, and that change accordingly. Women change their hairstyles, their dressing. It's completely different. They the social norm encourage women to get out of the objectification. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Any other comments or question? Okay, I will be around. And thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs>